Thank you so much for joining Conversations with Cohen. I'm your host, Greg Cohen, Office Leasing Specialist at Crescent. And this podcast is for office tenants to help educate them about all things regarding their office space, from leasing to architecture and everything in between. Whether you're an entrepreneur thinking about your first office or a director of real estate managing a large real estate portfolio, this podcast is for you. I've got an exciting show for you today. My guest is Larry Haber, the managing partner of the commercial real estate department at Abrams, Garfinkel, Margulies, Bergson, in addition to serving as the founder and CEO of Leasing Reality. We're going to be talking about clients' exposure to their office leases post-COVID, lease restructurings, modifications, and workouts, and what we may have learned from the coronavirus to help protect businesses going forward. We need to have businesses for our teams to come back to, so I thought it was important to speak with someone who's in the trenches fighting for them. By the way, if you want to reach me, I'm at Greg Cohen NYC on Instagram. And if you're new to this video series or podcast, hit the subscribe button below so you don't miss any future episodes. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Larry. If you don't know him, he's had a lifelong career in real estate in New York. He's been a practicing attorney for over 30 years, specializing in lease negotiations on behalf of tenants and landlords. He also brings an interesting perspective to his role, given his experience owning, managing, and developing over 6 million square feet of space in the tri-state area. Larry is also the founder of Leasing Reality, which offers a ton of education via blogs and podcasts about the office leasing process for first-time business owners to lifelong real estate professionals. As I'm sure folks know by now, I'm a huge believer in hiring a dedicated office leasing attorney when preparing to sign a lease because it's an incredibly nuanced subject matter that requires an expert. And I maintain it's money extremely well spent to ensure maximum flexibility and protection. Welcome, Larry, to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, my friend. How are we doing today? We're doing great, thanks. I'm, I'm Try, trying to remain sane and productive and safe and optimistic. Uh, it's the only way I know how to be. Exactly. Exactly. And, and we can only look at it as one day at a time, really, because I think if you uh, if you don't, you can very quickly get yourself down a rabbit hole, and that's not uh, that's not exactly you or your family. Oh, there's no Dallas in it. This is uncharted territory for everyone, you know using a modern Luther King line. We all came in on different ships. We're all in the same boat now, but it's just, it's, uh, it's distressing. You know, you have to keep your, your head above water and be optimistic. And it's difficult if you, if you spend too much time listening to the news. But the reality is, uh, you know, using a great line from a Grateful Dead song, you know, we will get by, we will survive. Uh, and mantra. To, I think it's a great mantra and, and it's, um, it's part of why I am doing what I'm doing here on this uh, on this podcast is uh, I'm a big believer that um, there's so much uncertainty out there and there are so many questions that people have. And I think they don't necessarily know where to turn to, uh, to answer those questions. Uh, I mean, you know, first and foremost, there's so much uncertainty right now about the physical workspace, right? The, the office. So, Larry, I've had a, a number of guests on, and we've talked about the, the physical workspace. We had Jen Mylan on, who talked about signage and wayfinding. We had Mark Spector talking about design. We had Mark Benhar talking about furniture. Um, Jim Perot talking about indoor air quality. What I'd like to speak with you today about is understanding, from a business's perspective, their obligations. So imagine you're a, a tenant who just signed a new 10-year lease a year ago, right? And, uh, and, and now your business has completely changed. And I, uh, I'd like to, to take today's conversation in the direction of how do tenants, um, how, do, how do tenants deal with their existing obligations? What are their options? Um, and how does, how does that conversation go with the landlord? How do you start that conversation with the landlord? And what are the realistic expectations that one should have uh, before you even get into that dialogue. Okay, so we have like five or six hours for this? Okay, <laughs> just, just to make sure. Listen, you know, it, it, I, the commercial lease is arguably the most one-sided, you know, offensive document in the free world. 
And I'm saying that as a landlord by training for the first 20 years of my career. It's pro-landlord. Uh, the thing about it is 90% of what is contained in that lease are business points. And I'm assuming, you know, what, what are all real estate professionals? We're business people, okay, as a tenants. It's, you know, these business points are the skies within legalese, but the bottom line is it's, it's how you negotiate that lease, you know. And unfortunately, and we can talk about it in a different context a little bit later, you know, your question pertains to leases that are already signed. Right. But, you know, you know, going off on just a, a, a quick uh, related you know, semi-non sequitur is – it's all about the five P's. Proper planning prevents poor performance. You need to prepare for as much as possible for as many contingencies that may happen, but very well might not. It's all about flexibility. If you ask me the two most important clauses in the lease here to negotiate, I pro- other than the financial terms, I'd say the assignment and subletting clause, which my lease is seven, eight pages of hell. Okay, and that's going to play a big part in what's going to be happening, you know, you know, over the coming months and I think for the next year or two. And then in New York, the good guy guarantee. Uh, you know, right now, as far as now you have a current lease, you just signed it. If it was for 50,000 square feet, I'm sure anyone who signed any large lease was wishing that they took probably three quarters of that space, if not less. But that is what it is. The clauses that you think would, uh, would maybe help you short of litigation and government intervention are not. The force majeure clause, which is, you know, just call it acts of God, and I don't want to get too boring on you and and granular, aren't helping tenants at all. Maybe as, you know, they do help them as to their non-monetary, you know, covenant performance, but not as to the payment of rent. Uh, It's beyond a rare day that a lease will state that if there's an act of God, or, or, or the force majeure event that you won't have to pay rent. It's stated explicitly that you have to pay it. Impossibility of performance, impracticability, that isn't helping tenants, unfortunately. Uh, business interruption insurance, I mean, right now, seemingly one of the few industries that have gone unscathed, other than maybe given some deferrals on premium payments, is the insurance industry. Right now, there's going to be a boatload of litigation about that. So now you're sitting there and you're dealing with the lease. You know, if, if you go back to the line I said about Martin Luther King before, you know, we're all in the same boat now. The bottom line is landlords and tenants need to work together. They need to listen. I don't think anytime soon we're going to see, uh, you know, putting virtual hugs aside, anyone, landlords and tenants hanging out and singing Kumbaya in Times Square. But, you know, the bottom line is they need to be friends. They need to be partners. They need to work together. But, you know. Listen, depending on whose calculator you're using, a landlord's mortgage payment, you know, probably, you know, if the, a better way of stating it, a, a rent payment is, you know, generally goes to, you know, 50, 60 percent of it is going to a landlord's mortgage, you know, quite possibly. And sometimes more, more, you know, more than that and sometimes less, you know, from my perspective. And I'm representing these days two and a half to one tenants to landlords. Uh, I can't possibly negotiate with a landlord unless I have empathy for them. I can't, you know, unless I know what makes them hot, what makes them not. I need to know whether or not they have a mortgage. Or part, what is that loan to value? Is it a portfolio loan where they could more easily deal with their lender? Or is it a CMBS loan where they, it, good luck getting somebody on the phone. Most people don't have the ability to do that, you know, it's getting a little bit better with the CMBSs, but but this there's that problem. And now, if I'm a landlord, um, but I, yeah, part of my issue among many is why am I the tenant's bank of first resort and last resort? If, if I'm going to be sitting there working with you as far as a, a lease restructuring, I need to know: Did you apply for PPP? Did you get the PPP? Are you going to give me the, that money? You know that that is allocable to rent currently, and hopefully that's going to change. Some, you know, there's there's hope by many, especially those in the restaurant industry. I know this is office that it's going to go more fifty percent towards payroll and and fifty percent towards rent and, and and other items as far as being paid back. Um, you know, so you you have that going for you, but but it's like I I do better when I'm negotiating on behalf of tenants, if I show a little bit of empathy to the landlords. 
and most people would consider me to be pro tenant if you if you if you hear all of my material that I have online between you know police and reality and the podcast and that's not the case you know that, that you know um, um, listen it, obviously I'm advocate passionately for whoever I'm, I'm you know representing but the short version is is that you know tenants and landlords need to work together you know the the lease is important what that lease states you know. I tell brokers when I train brokers that, you know, as far as it all begins at the letter of intent stage and you have to be having this mindset. I call it the, uh, the Snagglepuss Groucho Marx the, uh, class Steve McQueen great escape theory. When you're putting that the, the initially pen to, you know, pen to uh, pencil, pen to pad, I should say, or just typing up your LOI, uh, obviously, you need to be thinking, you know, Snagglepuss out of line, exit stage left. Groucho Marx once met someone he didn't like, and he did the original this. He pulled his hand back, and he said, hello, I must be going. You need to be thinking about, at the LOI stage, how the hell am I getting my tenant out of this lease? How am I going to put them in a position that if they need an exit strategy, they can get out? How can they monetize their investment in the space if that's the case? How can they mitigate their losses if the economy turns, if something like COVID happens? And that's, you know, and that's such a big part of it. So you know, right now, listen, most, basically all the brokerage firms will come close to uh, charging nothing or next to nothing to review a lease. I will do a review of the lease for the same thing. It's like, this is bottom line is, you're here to help one another right now, and it's the way you cultivate business. You need to see what your lease states. And I, as I said, you know, I can go on and on on this particular subject, but the lease, it's, you know, you have to, you know, Four purposes of how you're going to deal with what's going on. You got to look at the assignment and subletting clause, what you can and can't do, what restrictions the landlord has imposed upon you in that clause. Listen, my subletting and assignment clause as a landlord is seven to eight pages of sheer help for a tenant. Okay. When I'm on the other side, um, I like to use the expression, I take a, sharp, a finely sharpened surgical machete. To, to the assignment and sublet and clause that a landlord puts in front of me because I'm so worried about the exit strategy. And part of the big thing that you're going to be doing, you know, Greg, in the coming months is you're going to be doing a lot of sublet and, and assignments. You know, a lot of that's going to be coming in and people are going to be looking to offload spaces, share spaces, you know. So let, let me stop and you ask me another question so you put me on, on a That's really a great segue, yeah. I think, because – Subletting is going to be so topical now more than ever. Um, for anybody who's watched anything that I've uh, put out over the last few years, it's my favorite part of the market to get it for tenants because I think it's the best and most opportunistic part of the market. You know, the fact that you can come into a space where someone's already spent a heck load of money and you can just literally plug and play is, you know, is is a gem. And also, by the way, I think short term short term subleases right now are going to probably trade at a smaller at a premium to what they were for because people now more than ever want that flexibility. So with that said, um, how should tenants who are going into a sublease, what should they be thinking about as things to look for as they negotiate that sublease? Oh, listen, yeah, where there's risk, there is reward. Okay, why are most it's making a generalization, but why are most tenants turning into sub landlords? Why are they subletting out their space? Because they they're having they either have way too much space, uh, they're deciding to leave New York and move to Kansas or the Burbs, and and they have financial problems. So just as a landlord, when you know, will do their financial due diligence on a tenant when it's coming into the building, yes. The sub landlord's going to do that to the sub tenant, but at the same time, the sub tenant needs to do it to the sub landlord. I know, and that might sound strange to a lot of people, but you know, in the context I just laid out, I need to know that the sub landlord has financial substance so that they're not going to take just, you know, by way of example, if the rent is a dollar and I'm paying as a sub tenant 80 cents to the sub landlord. I want to make sure that the sub landlord's going to take my 80 cents, put their 20 cents in and pay the landlord a dollar. And not that my 80 cents will stay in their pocket and remain south. Because as a subtenant, you don't have privity with the landlord. 
your sublease, your subtenancy subject to what the deal is between the, uh, the, your sub-landlord as tenant and the landlord. And if the sub-landlord doesn't pay, the landlord ultimately has the right to terminate the lease and you'd be out on the street. So you need to do that financial due diligence. As far as your security deposit is concerned, never. Never is a really big word. I hate to use it. But I do my best, you know, as, a, as, as a, to advise subtenants, never, if you can avoid it, give your security deposit to your sub-landlord in the form of cash security deposit. Get a letter of credit. Make sure, you know, yes, it costs you something, but you want it because if, you know, if your sub-landlord goes bad on you, chances are they very well have spent your security deposit, and it puts you in a very bad position. Uh, you you know, and the bottom line is, listen, you'd like to get your rent at a discount. You know, you want to make sure that you can deal directly with the landlord. If you need extra services, you don't want to have to go through the sub landlord to get those services. If there's certain things you want to do to the space, you want to get that approved um, in the consent in the sub. You want to make it a condition to the sublease as far as the landlord consenting upon it. You know, and for those who who are have more negotiating juice? How I said before, if the sub landlord doesn't perform, uh, your your sub tenancy could be at risk, and and the landlord can terminate the lease, and then by association your sub lease. Ask for a landlord non disturb agreement, which says the landlord will honor your sub tenancy if your sub landlord becomes bad. Okay, right. and having the right also to pay. The landlord directly if the sub landlord's in default, you want notices of default. I can go on and on. Well, these, these, these are great nuggets. Yeah, you, know, you can find a lot of this, but you know that's on there. Okay. Okay. So, um, so if we turn for a t- turn direction for a second, and we talk about COVID, um, the current environment that we're in, I would imagine there are some lessons that we uh, that tenants may have learned um, through this. That, you know, you say, and I agree that the attorney's role is to think about all those things that could go wrong that hopefully never go wrong, right? Um, so it's to prepare for the worst. By the way, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think it's the broker's role also. Okay. Because uh, it, 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 listen, it's a, it, commer- leasing is a niche business, and as I said, it's business points. You know. Uh, you don't always want to rely on the attorneys. I'm not putting it on the broker. I'm just sitting there saying it's a niche business. And because it's business, you know, you know, a, a good broker will, will know about a lot of the potential pitfalls business wise. And I, and, and I completely agree with that. Um, but, it, and, and in fact, it's not on the attorney, nor should the depend, dependency be on the attorney to understand any of those business points, because that's not what they do for a living. Their their job is to put it in a language in legalese. So um, yeah, so yeah, so a lot of attorneys do know how to know the business end of it, but but the reality is is that you listen from a the reason why bro- brokers are so wonderful in a myriad of ways, and the ones who are the best are the ones who are goal line to goal line. Because what's what's your view of most attorneys? Yeah, the nice way of stating it is most of us, if not all of us, are peters, pain in the asses. OK, we're, we're, we're perceived as deal breakers, not deal makers. When you try and you know, bring up business points, it's like, what are you doing, attorney? You know, you shouldn't be talking about that. But 90 percent of the lease is business points. So that's that's why I'm sitting there saying brokers need to tee it up at the beginning. They need to know 100 so percent. You know? 100 percent. That's right. Um, and they should be there. And this is something that I do. Uh, they should be there for the lease review and to read page by page along along with the attorneys, not not just to hand it off to expect them to be to read everything. It, oh, there's no doubt. You you need to be a combination of uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Paul McCartney, to, you know, be, and be the voice of reason in back channel. So that you're sitting there saying, "There's no time for fussing and fighting, my friends. We can work it out." Okay, <laughs> it's so important because at the end of the day, you know, sometimes you know. Listen, there's a lot of uh, my legal brethren, no offense, and, and every now and then I, I may be guilty of this a little bit, but you know, too many attorneys think they're splitting an atom or curing cancer or, or curing COVID, you know? Bottom line is, I, I haven't come close on any of those things, okay? Yeah. And 
you need to, you know, the brokers, it's, they're so integral. The ones, you know, the worst thing you ever want a landlord or a tenant saying to me offline is, where's Greg? What's he out on the beach chair in the Hamptons, you know, or up in Hudson Valley waiting for the, the deal to close? It's, you, you need to be there because to, to get help, you know, push that deal across the finish line, right. you know, so. Um, okay, so what what have we learned? What have tenants learned? What do you think, you know, the, the two or three things, maybe there's not all, maybe there aren't two or three, but what are those things that are the, uh, are the initial standouts that uh, the tenants are saying they wish they would have had or they wish they would have thought of so that they think of it next time. They think of it for the next time. That's, you know, there's, uh, there's many things. I look at it, I talk about the exit strategy. Yep. Right now in my, remember, you're, you're, it's, and it's, it's a little bit of a long-winded answer, but if, if you just, if you're doing a deal for 10,000 square feet, because this plays into the answer in a big way, 10,000 square feet, $60 a square foot, uh, a $60 work letter, and six months free rent with you know, brokers on both sides of the table. That equals that the landlord's laying out $1.2 million in the first year of the lease. And you're, so you're serving up as a, as a tenant broker, this tenant concession cocktail to the landlord, and the landlord's underwriting the deal. And they're underwriting it based upon many factors, but the strength of the tenant, okay, financially. Uh, so you get into what's the right amount of security deposit, and there's the battle between, is it three months, six months, nine months? But at the end of the day, as a tenant, and, and is there going to be a good guy guarantee and how many legal and business steroids will be in that good guy guarantee? So, yeah, of course, the landlord's underwriting not only the strength of the, of, the, of the tenant, but also the collateral, so to speak, and, you know, meaning security deposit and, and the good guy. Um, but I, as a tenant, this is the first point, if I can, if I don't have to put the mothership entity on the hook, Okay, and I could put a shell entity on the hook. That's a beautiful thing. Okay, it and that's not always possible. Needless to say, uh, I'd rather put up more in security. Okay, if you're talking about the flexibility, this is about the exit strategy. Yeah, but it'll hurt when and if that time comes. I'd rather put more up, at least at the beginning of the lease, and have that ability to escape. Because if my, if the name tenant does not have any financial substance, if it's not the operating entity, so to speak, it allows a a quicker exit. And from the standpoint of, you know, when you put up too much security at the beginning, you could negotiate a burn down of the lease. You know, I know you're a big, you know, you, you, you were a disco guy back in the day, you know. And, you burn, know, baby, burn. You know, I, well, I know you burn, baby, burn. Exactly. That song by from the Tramps, you know, and you have to have it. And, and you should be doing it as a broker, I think, asking for a burn down during the, the LOI stage. Absolutely. But, but, you know, my point is if you put up too much security at the beginning, great. After you've been a good you know, boy or girl, you know, for three, four years from, from rent commencement date, hopefully sooner, okay, that, that excess security starts to burn down to something that's more reasonable. You know, from the standpoint, as a, as a landlord, I'm more worried, and we're not talking about the big national tenants, okay, but, you know, as a landlord, I'm worried about my short-term risks. You know, once I enter into a 10-year deal, I'd like the tenant to live up to that lease, but I want to know that, you know, if I'm laying out all this money that I'm covered in the first few years, and as long as you're, as a tenant, your crystal ball of life says, I'm going to be in business for a few years in this space, then I'm willing in the good guy guarantee. And, and there's nothing good about a good guy guarantee, really. And it's misunderstood, and that's a whole other topic. But uh, the short is where it is good, you know, it, if drafted correctly and negotiated correctly, it helps you with the exit strategy. But it also gets you the, the the goal, meaning the tenant concession cocktail that you're that you're serving up. So if your crystal ball of life is good as a tenant, at least in the short term, you could sit there and agree and say, I won't exercise my rights to ex use the, the good guy guarantee to terminate my personal liability under the lease, you know, while the entity I own and controls is in possession until two years from the rent commencement date. And if I give back the space in that first two years, this is, you don't want to be volunteering this, but it's certain ways of 
being able to use the shell entity, you know, the negatives you're trying to use as a positive. Uh, if I get back to space in the first two years from rent commencement, I will pay landlords your unamortized cost of doing the deal at 1.2 million. But if I survive after that, you get goose eggs, my friend. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. For three years. And, and so part of it is like, it's, it's using all the various tools out there, both from, for a good, you know, positively and negatively, but I'm always, it's all about the exit strategy to me. So try not to put the, the, the mothership on, on the hook. Try to be able to negotiate your assignment and subletting clause with great flexibility. Like right now, there are many leases out there that sadly will say that you can't sublet your space if it's less than the rent that's called for in the lease. You can't sublet it at a discount. That's horrible if that's the case, okay? Because uh, right now, landlords are going to be faced with increased competition from, as to leasing out their space by subtenants, by their, sub, their tenants who are becoming sublandlords. You want it to say, at worst, I can't advertise my space if I'm subletting for you know, you know for less than what the rental is, and that's why when you see on CoStar, among many reasons, it always says upon request when you're talking about what what the the rent is. You know, this right. way you're not advertising. You you need to just you know we have for example, and I always you know I I, I really want I like brokers to do this more in their term sheets uh, that we can sublet up to one third of our space without the landlord's consent. Okay. Which is important. So this way, listen, as a broker, it's a great move because it, when, when a tenant is looking to take on 12,000 square feet, but they want growth, it's like, Hey, maybe you should really be taking 15,000 square feet, but, but you know, to provide for that growth or 18,000 square feet, but you know, it'll give you the short term flexibility to have, people in there sublet, subletting out some space from you. Uh, having that helps quite a bit. Uh, you know, really, uh, the, the subletting and assignment clause is just paramount. You, you want to get as, as least restrictions in there as possible as a landlord. Can't state it any clearer. You know, you, you, need, you, know, you need to be a control freak. You need to, it's my space. What's the basic, you know, one of the basic premises of a landlord is that I'm in the business of renting out space for profit. You, tenant, are in the business of renting out my space so you can conduct your business, so you can make a profit, and oh, yeah, along the way, pay me my rent. If anyone's going to make profit on, on my space, it's me, landlord, not you, tenant. And that's kind of where the battle is. So when you learn, it's like try and just get as much flexibility and exit, and exit strategies as possible to deal with the changes in life, the ch- personally and professionally, the changes in business, the economy, and obviously what's what's happened now, you know. And a lot a, of people and stuck. Great, and that's a great lesson for a tenant that's been in business for 20 years or a business or a business that's coming in for the first time. It's about flexibility. Yeah, I mean, I mean let me ask you something. Like, I, 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 listen, we're both married, but if, if you were going out on a blind date right now, wouldn't you have an exit strategy? You know, wouldn't you have somebody text you 20 minutes in Something along those lines. So if you have an exit strategy, and it's an extreme example, but if you have an exit strategy in, in life, why wouldn't you have it in business? And I'm, I am still amazed because unfortunately now I'm in that phase where I'm brought in for damage control, how the exit strategies are just not negotiated. I wasn't there for the negotiation of the lease, okay? And I don't know what someone got in order and, and had to give up to get it, but that's among the most important things in there. If you put, you know, you ask me what are the most, that's the most important they are, those, those, those items, you know, so, it's so, 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 so important. And when did you get involved in the process to begin with, with a tenant, right? Before, before, I would imagine the best time that you get involved is not when uh, LOI is already agreed to. So when is the best, when is the best time for a tenant to engage Larry Haber and his services in the in the lease process. Um, some brokers might agree with disagree. I should say with this, but at at the LOI stage, or you know, while it's being negotiated before the first. And listen, the bottom line is cost is always a factor. You remember, I'm I'm an unusual bird at many levels, and and one of them is because I was on the ownership side. My mind isn't geared to the hourly rate. Ninety percent of my 
commercial practices done on flat fees, which is unusual. Um, and, you know, as a general statement, most of my clients are, are, get a, a bonus by having me in earlier in the game because it makes, and I may be ghosting in the background. And before you might send out your initial draft, I'll look it over because I want to make sure, you know, that certain things, The ed, I'm really concerned about the exit strategy. So, you know, what I see, and I think so, I should be in as close to the beginning as possible. I'd say just because people know that I do this, I'm involved maybe 20 to 25% of the time, you know, during the LOI stage, right. you know, a lot of times in the background, but I will get as a tenant's attorney. And remember, I'm the deal breaker, my perception, not the deal maker, you know, don't be touching business points. I'll get an LOI that will say good guy guarantee by tenant's principles and nothing else. Okay. If that, when I get that, well, better way of saying that, if I'm the landlord's attorney and I get that, what they have waiting for me is my is my good guy guarantee, which will kick a, a guarantee what's called 27 different ways to Tuesday. Okay. And that, so I want, you know, I want it to contain three sentences, you know, uh, which, you know, if you go on to Lisa Reality, I did, I did a, a free CD thing last week where you can see the replay on it. It talks about all the strategies. Okay, and it talks about what a landlord should do and how a tenant should counteract it. But you know, you, you want to do that. You want to make sure that there's enough language in there. If I'm on, if it's an assignment clause, chances are many clauses will state in a, in a letter of intent: uh, landlord should not unreasonably withhold or delay its consent, subject to terms and conditions to be negotiated. That's a landlord's dream. Okay, sure. punt it to to the lease negotiation stage when a tenant has less leverage. A tenant never has more leverage than during the LOI stage. So try and cut my answer short. You want me involved more at the beginning. If you, if, bottom line is, if you're a rock star broker and you, you, know, you take pride in workmanship and you, you, you have mastered your craft, you'll know to do this. And it's a fine line. You can't negotiate a 10-page term sheet, okay, unless you're talking about you know, a, a crazy amount of square footage. It's all context. But... You know, there is an art to being a broker when it's drafting a letter of intent that you can get so much in there. That's when you truly, truly can add value during the LOI stage. And you can do it in a three-page, four-page LOI. It's being concise in what you do. I, you know, listen, I'm so obsessed with LOIs. I have a 24-part series on it on Lisa Reality. And I'll be sure, and I'll be sure, Larry, yeah. to... Uh... Okay. You know, put, the, put that in the show notes because I think there's just a yeah, wealth, so, so, a yeah, wealth of the, information. The, the early, the better. The bottom line is the, 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 the better the, the broker is at his or her game, the less I am needed at the LOI stage. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, well, first of all, thank you for sharing that insight because, I, like you said, there's just – go on for days talking about the, the, uh, the process and, and the details within the process. Um, for those who uh, – who don't know Larry or haven't been exposed to uh, leasing reality, you make tons of references to music, um, and uh, and no episode of of uh, Greg C TV would uh, would be complete without talking about food. So I was hoping we could talk about the two a little bit. I was curious uh, to hear from you. I got a couple of questions about music. So what was your first show? Oh God, uh, Sly and the Family Stone. Nassau Coliseum, third row. How old were you? To the music. How old? How old were you when you uh, when you saw that? Uh, it was 1973. It was. It, I think it was the day that the Mets were playing in the playoffs against the Reds, and Bud Harrelson got into that fight with Pete Rose at second base. Okay, it was on a Saturday. I don't know that game might have been a Monday, but I, I remember vividly that, that there was some connection there. Wow. Uh, and yes. was that was that what turned? Would you say that first concert turned you on to live music? Uh, I I really loved the show. I was kind of hesitant. My my buddies used to love music, and I I was like, okay, it's good. But then um, you know, came you know ninth tenth grade, and you know between new wave and punk coming out, and this uh, little band called the Grateful Dead, you know, uh, that I discovered, um, you know, became a different thing, it became part of my fabric. And, and, and the way I teach now, I use rock and roll, hip hop, pop culture, and historical analogies as learning mnemonics. And people are always amazed at it, you know, because I'm, I'm, not that it's a badge of honor, I'm kind of the king of meaningless trivia, 
Uh, it's the way I, and people are like, where do you come up with this? I go, it's the way I talked in high school. It's the way I, we, we would use movie lines. You know, you, you know, you sit there and it's just like when I, when, when I have someone who's on the phone call, who's losing it in a negotiation, I, and I'll, I'll sit there just to break it up and not sound like an idiot, but they try to add a little humor to it. I'll say, listen, you obviously are too much of a James Conn fan from The Godfather and Sonny. Don't you remember the line that Michael Corleone and, Don, and Tom Hagen said to you, Sonny? I go, Sonny, it's not, it's not personal. It's strictly business. And that's the way I, I talk. So it's the way I teach, you know, and it makes it, it, makes it more fun with music, you know? And it's, and it's good to bring a little bit of levity to, uh, to a serious situation. To, yeah, because as I said before, yeah, none of us is, is, yeah, is curing cancer. or splitting an atom. <laughs> So, uh, so where was the where's the farthest you've traveled to see live music? Uh, let's see. Um, as north as Toronto, uh, freshman year, I saw the Grateful Dead there. I saw Jerry Garcia in Berkeley, California, when I was backpacking. Uh, I, I, I've basically covered the, the the four corners so of, of the United States, but it's. But I was never one who, who got on the bandwagon and traveled. Like, I would make trips around certain things. You know, like, like I saw David Byrne up in Buffalo a few years ago, and he just did an amazing concert tour uh, called American Utopia. And it ended up being a Broadway show that was you know, critically acclaimed. Yeah. Uh, I saw the third show of this tour when he was starting before it was going to be a play. It was going to be in Buffalo at the college there. So I went. I went and bought you know tickets to that, and I told my son who works with me. He said, "We'll turn it into a business trip somehow," and we did. You know, so yeah, I'm, I'm I'm fairly good at mixing business with pleasure. I was supposed to see the Who Saturday night in Vegas at ICSC. Oh well, mm. okay, mm. <laughs> you know that that didn't happen. You know, so but uh, next year, hopefully, hopefully, and, and there's uh, always there's always New Orleans. <laughs> so I was going to say, so, uh, so bringing it to food and music, what is, uh, you know, as it's taken you all across the country, what is the uh, most interesting food that you've had while, uh, while either going to a concert or, uh, or on your travels to a concert? Well, listen, I threw a tail. I turned 60 last year, the, the week that um, uh, the, the dead, again, were playing at City Field. I threw a tailgate for 60 people. And all the foods that were there that, that I brought and whatever the people brought, that was, that was the best. You know, like right now, what would you give to be at a tailgate at City Field with 60 of your friends? And okay. what was served? So give us a little, give us a little, you know, give us oh, a little. Oh, whether, whether it was, you know, whether it was sushi from one of my favorite places or. or Which or, is what? Or, 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 uh, oh, God. Uh, it's a place called Dorada. And, and Kumo out here, you know, in, in, in the area. And, and you know, from Chris and Tony's, you know, like chicken scaparella and weedy and white clam sauce. And, wow. you know, and it just went from there. But, you know, and it's like, you, you, you know, you pine for those days now. But, uh, you know. Look at them again. You go, you go to Jazz Fest, it's, you know, it's, it's all about cross ship, you know, crawfish Monica, you know, which is just, oh. It's just an amazing pasta dish, you know, in a little tiny bowl with, with crawfish that are out of the shell of a great, you know, red creamy sauce. It's like, it's Sounds incredible. amazing. You're getting me hungry. Yeah, yeah it's, it's incredible. <laughs> well, Larry, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to, to, to impart some wisdom to us, share with us um, how we can help navigate, you know, through, through what... Uh, some difficult times and uh, and help answer some of the questions that I know are on a lot of tenants' minds. No, I pre I appreciate the opportunity to come on. And hopefully, I didn't bore people too much. But uh, you know, it's like listen, it's 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 going to be a long road. It's a marathon, and the bottom line is, we're going to get past this. We've got through this uh, in the past, and we're going to do it again. You know, and in the interim, we just have to find ways to remain, you know, sane and safe and productive and optimistic. You know. And the bottom line is, is that we're, we're going to get past this. It's just, it's going to be a little bit of a road. And I think patience is going to be a very big factor. So I'll be, put, I'll be sure to put all of the, uh, all of the details of how people can get in touch with you and, uh, and learn more on leasing reality in the show notes. And uh, my name is Greg Cohen from Cressa. And I uh, want to thank you all for listening. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye yeah, for now. Thank you so much for the opportunity, my friend. Thank Appreciate you, Larry. It.